Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Virtual Planetarium from the Museum of Science. My name is Emily. My pronouns are she and her, and I will be your moderator during this program. So that means that if you are watching us on Zoom, uh, I am the person watching the Q&A box on your screen. So if you have a question or a comment throughout the program, feel free to feel free to drop it into that box and I will relay that question to our educator today. Now we also offer closed captions throughout the program. So if you would like to see those captions, you can click on the CC button on your screen and then select show subtitles. So with that, I think we can welcome our main educator and we'll get started. Thanks, Emily. Hi, everybody. My name is Katie. My pronouns are she and her. And today I will be your educator and providing the visuals um, as we talk about the Chinese space station Tiangong. So if you've tuned into previous weeks this month, um, you know that we have been talking about various space stations. Um, we have talked about the Salyut space station whole program. That was the first one ever uh, in space by the USSR. Uh, and then we talked about Skylab, which was the United States first and really only uh, space station that was solely owned by the United States. And we've also talked about Mir, which was uh, another space station by Roscosmos. So this week we are going to be talking about Tiangong, uh, which is pretty cool because it's actually being constructed right now. So it's not a space station that, you know, had its time in the past. Um, it's actually being constructed now with its first parts uh, launching this past April. So this will be China's first long-term modular space station. And let me give you some visuals. There we go. Uh, so the first long-term space station, and it translates to heavenly or celestial palace, which I think is a really awesome name. Um, and as I mentioned, the very first module of this space station was launched back in August. It was called, or it is called the Tianhe Core Command Module. Um, Tianhe means, it's basically the word for the Milky Way. So that big kind of splashing, uh, cloudy band that stretches across the sky when you are out someplace really far away from a city. Um, that is what that refers to. Another very cool name. Uh, I've noticed that a lot of the names for all of the spacecraft and various modules have really interesting meanings. Um, now, before the Tiangong Space Station has started construction, there were two previous space stations that were not modular, so they were just kind of like one piece um, that were meant to test docking technologies. Um, and you may have heard of those that was Tiangong 1 and Tiangong 2. So throughout the program today, I'm going to be talking about all three of these things, so it can get a little confusing. So Tiangong 1 and Tiangong 2 were preliminary space stations that were not meant to be permanent. They were just used to test various technologies for the Tiangong space station. So the space station doesn't have any number associated with it. So hopefully that'll kind of help uh, as we go through the material today. All right, so just some basic facts uh, about the space station. So it was, the, the first part of it was launched in April. It is about a fifth of the size of the International Space Station, which is the size of about a football field. So like a fifth of a football field, you can kind of think of it that way, um, or the, about the same size as Mir, the station, uh, the space station from Russia that was in orbit uh, mostly throughout the 90s. So it is the Chinese Manned Space Agency, CMSA, that operates this particular space station. There are plans to collaborate with other nations in the future once the space station is actually put together as well. And the very first mission, uh, the first crewed mission, is the Shenzhou 12, which launched this past June. And we will talk about that a little bit later. So that was the first crewed mission to the space station. This image here is an artist's rendition of the space station once it's complete. 
Um, you'll notice that there's going to be a lot of like models or artist renditions throughout this program because a lot of the images that are available um, you have to have like permission for and they are not like widely accessible. So there's a lot of drawings and, and uh, impressions and things like that, but they're still really cool. Uh, so this is what it will look like eventually. And here is a model of the Shenzhou capsule. So to compare it to uh, the International Space Station, the ISS uses the Soyuz modules to um, carry humans back and forth from Earth to the space station. This is the equivalent of the Soyuz module for Tiangong. Um, and these particular spacecraft, the Shenzhou spacecraft, have been uh, taking humans as well as cargo to space since the early 2000s. This particular crewed mission, um, the 12th one, will be the seventh crewed mission for China. But it looks a lot like the Soyuz module. Um, it's got the orbital module, the re-entry kind of capsule part of it, and it's also got the service module with solar panels on either side of it. So this is what's bringing people and cargo to and from both the Tiangong space station as well as the preliminary um, space stations as well, the Tiangong 1 and 2. All right, uh, so some of the missions, very similar to a lot of the missions of other space stations that we've talked about, um, definitely testing rendezvous technology, so the ability to have your um, space capsule, your spacecraft, um, like orbital module and all of that docking with the actual space station itself. Um, there will also be a lot of experiments with human physiology, human spaceflight, long-term spaceflight on the human body, uh, being able to survive in space for long-term periods of time with relatively little help from folks on the ground. There'll be a lot of research in that. Um, also regenerative life support. So systems that basically recycle food and water and even human waste, there'll be a lot of research in those areas as well. Um, they will also be testing various transportation vehicles, performing spacewalks, um, and just de further developing technologies that can be used in the future once the space station is finally put together. So this image that you're looking at right now is the Tianhe core module before it launched. So this is the first part of the Tian Tiangong space station that was launched this past April. And this is all that's up there right now. This isn't the whole thing, but it's the first part. Uh, and this is what it looked like before launch. And here is an actual picture of its launch. Now, you may have remembered uh, back this spring, there was a lot of buzz going on in the news about how the rocket, which is called the Long March, uh, that took the Tianhe module into space ended up going too fast and actually got in Earth orbit, um, which was not planned for and not intended. So the rocket actually had an uncontrolled descent or re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. This is not the first time this has happened. Every space agency has had something come down uncontrolled. Um, we can think back to the USSR Salyut 7 that came uh, hurtling back to the Earth. I think some debris landed in Argentina. The US's Skylab also had an uncontrolled re-entry. A lot of debris was found in the uh, Southern Indian Ocean as well as Western Australia. And this particular rocket, some debris uh, was found kind of near the Maldives um, in the Indian Ocean as well. So the chances of any kind of equipment or material coming back and hitting a person or a building or really anything that would affect humans is actually pretty small since the earth is mostly water. So generally these are things to be definitely cautious of and you wanna have a plan in case something like this does happen, but the likelihood of there being any damage to 
people um, is pretty slim. So, you know, you don't have to worry too much, but it happens a lot more than people think. Um, Cause I know this had a lot of press, but it happens a lot. Um, and it also happened with the Tiangong one uh, mission as well. So I'll talk about that in a moment. All right, so this cabin or the, the core here is going to be like the cabin for the astronauts. This will have their living quarters, um, guidance, uh, command center, navigation, all that kind of stuff. And then there are two other modules that are planned to go up by the end of 2022. So the whole space station should be done at the end of 2022. And this is called the Wenqian module. And at the top there, that's the interior uh, of, the, of the module. You can see it's got a lot of the same stuff as the main Tianhe uh, module. So it's kind of almost like a backup, backup controls, backup power, uh, a lot of that in this particular module. It's got a lot of solar arrays. You can see it's got a, a, a chamber for when astronauts perform EVAs. It's got a, I don't know how to pronounce this, but it says a, a LIAPA arm, which is kind of similar to the Canada arm on the International Space Station. So it's like this big mechanical or robotic arm that is able to grab like payloads uh, and just assist in like extravehicular activities for um, astronauts. So it's got one of those, very necessary for all space stations to have them. And then down at the bottom there, that's just kind of the exterior um, of this module. And then the other one, again, very similar to both the Wenqian and the Tianhe um, command module, a lot of backup stuff, uh, solar arrays, as well as a lot of the experimental equipment. So they've got a ton of experiments planned. So they have these storage racks for all the different types of experiments, and they're very similar to the ones that NASA uses in the US orbital segment on the ISS, and I'm sure other space agencies use very similar styled um, storage as well. All right, so I'm gonna pause there and see if any questions have come in so far. Thank you, Katie. Uh, we actually haven't had any questions yet. I do have to say that I'm obsessed with the translation of Tian Gong. That's so pretty, the celestial palace, I love that. Yeah, it's gorgeous, I love yeah. it. Um, right. So I think we're safe to move on for now. Okay, sounds good. All right, so the next part, I wanted to talk about uh, the Tiangong 1 and Tiangong 2 missions that happened before the uh, actual space station started launching. So the Tiangong space station. Um, so Tiangong 1, and this is a model of it, you can see on the left, that is Tiangong 1. And then on the right is one of those uh, Shenzhou capsules. So the, the carriers for humans um, actually docked with the Tiangong 1. And I, I thought this was really cool. So in China, a lot of folks have been comparing the docking of the past Tiangong missions, as well as the current one, to a story called The Cowherd and the Weaver Girl, which is a story from Chinese folklore about these constellations and these stars in the sky. It's kind of like a forbidden love story. Um, so I will talk about that toward the end of the program. We'll switch on over and, and look at those actual stars and talk about the story for a little bit, but I thought that was really cool. So this was the first kind of prototype space station for China. Um, it orbited from September 2011 to 2018, in which it had another uncontrolled entry. Um, this time, I believe it landed in the South Pacific, which is actually an area called um, like a spacecraft graveyard, because that is where a lot of the times engineers intend for spacecraft to re-enter because there's not any land near there and there's just really no chance of anything really bad happening if something lands there. Um, so this was a complete coincidence that it landed in that part of the ocean because again it was uncontrolled. Um, 
but yeah, it was just another another one of those incidents. And again, no harm uh, was done. And it is in the spacecraft graveyard now. So this particular space station was visited by several crewed missions. So the Shenzhou spacecraft, I think it was eight, nine, and 10 all went to um, this space station. And they were notable for having the first uh, female astronauts from China on board. So this is the launch of Tiangong-1. And here are the first female astronauts from China. So we have Liu Yang and Wang Yaping. Liu Yang was the first uh, Chinese female astronaut to go up into space. She was on the Shenzhou 9 spacecraft, um, which launched on June 16th of 2012, which was exactly 49 years after the very first woman to ever go into space, who was Valentina Tereshkova from, at the time it was the Soviet Union. Uh, she was a cosmonaut. So it's to the day, uh, 49 years in the future. And then Wang Yaping, she went up on the next mission, the Shenzhou 10. And while she was up there, uh, she taught physics classes to schools back in China over a live broadcast, which I thought was really cool. All right. And then we've got Tiangong 2. Not very different from the first one. Very similar in structure. Again, this is a model of uh, uh, more of those Shenzhou missions docking with the main Tiangong space station. Um, I believe there was one crewed mission here, the Shenzhou uh, 12, 11. Shenzhou 12 is the current space station. And on this space station, again, they were just testing a lot of docking technologies. It was not planned to be permanent whatsoever. It was up there for three years from 2016 to 2019. And uh, there were, yeah, the crew of the 11 um, was there for about 30 days. And they did a whole bunch of experiments on weightlessness. So being in microgravity and uh, human machine collaboration and how that dynamic works when you're in space. Um, particularly on maintenance technology. Um, and they also, I believe, re released a satellite. I'm not sure what the purpose of that satellite was, but um, they also sent one of those out as well. All right, so this is the launch of the Shenzhou 12, which we're going back now to the main space station, the Tiangong space station that was launched earlier in April this year. Um, so this was the first crewed mission. These astronauts are still on board because they launched back in June and they're going to be there for three months. So they are kind of approaching the end of their mission. Um, this is the seventh crewed space flight for China. It's carrying three astronauts. Um, and this will be the first of four crewed missions sent to the core module before the completion of the entire space station. There are two spacewalks planned, and they've actually both already happened. The first one was on July 4th, and that was mainly to test new spacesuits, as well as installing equipment for future missions. The second one, and that first one was actually the longest spacewalk for Chinese uh, astronauts ever. It was like seven hours long. The second one just happened like a few days ago on August 20th, um, when it, again, it was more testing, installing equipment and that type of thing. And here is that model once again of the Shenzhou capsule. Um, it is based off of the Soyuz. I think I mentioned that already. And then of course we have kind of like a summary of the experiments that are planned on board. So Roscosmos, the Russian Space Agency, as well as the European Space, Space Agency, both have plans to conduct experiments in collaboration with the Chinese Space Agency. And here are the kind of primary topic areas. We've got space life sciences, biotechnology, microgravity, physics and combustion, material science, um, 
more physics and microgravity and so much more. And on the right, this is a picture of the current crew members um, inside of Tianhe, which again means the Milky Way. And that'll come back when we talk about our, our folklore story as well. All right, so now I'm gonna switch us on over to Stellarium. And if any, if any questions come in, Emily, I have so many windows up, so I, I can't <laughs> tell. <laughs> yeah, we actually do have a few that came in. Um, one of them is what is the life expect expectancy of a space station like this? That is a very good question. Um, I actually don't know. I'm not sure how long this particular space station is supposed to be in orbit. Uh, I can find out very quickly though. And hopefully everyone can see Stellarium too so you can look at the beautiful nighttime sky while I do this real quick. <laughs> we can see Stellarium. Awesome. We can also, we can always, you know, say that even if we can't answer a question here, that's always an opportunity to look it up. Very for true. all of us. Very, very true. Yeah, I can't find it fast enough, so I'm going to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for trying. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, any other questions before we go? Yeah, uh, someone was wondering um, how this will affect the U.S. in particular. That is a very good question. Um, and again, I don't know. Currently, there is... And unfortunately, there's a law called the Wolf Amendment that was passed in 2011 that forbids NASA to spend uh, any kind of government money on collaborations with the Chinese Space Agency. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of politics involved in that, and hopefully that will change in the future um, because we see the success of the International Space Station and what can happen when countries collaborate together. Um, and just, you know, space is incredible that like, how could we not all band together and explore it? Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll see what happens in the future, but I, I'm not sure. But as of right now, unfortunately, there really isn't much planned uh, for any kind of collaboration because there can't be. Wow, that's very interesting. Um, let's see. I have two more, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, how many total flights are needed to get this whole thing in, into space? So those three modules are, there's, if I go back to the PowerPoint really quickly, and I can go to the first slide. Um, so in this diagram here, you can see there are five different parts of it. So each of these modules are actually going up fully assembled, which is unlike the International Space Station where all of the modules went up and then astronauts had to perform spacewalks to connect like cables and pipes and things like that. Um, so these will come up fully ready to go. So I believe it should take uh, three for the main space station, um, which Tianhe is already there. And then we just have the Mengtian and the Wentian modules. Um, so that's the main space station. So that's three, three launches. And then the Shenzhou is the crewed. So those will be going back and forth. And then the Tianzhou that you can see in pink there is cargo. So those are just going to be like payloads that go to and from delivering supplies to the astronauts. So for the main spacecraft, or the, the main space station, uh, it should be three different launches, one of which already happened. Cool, thank you. And the last one that I have is, do you have any sense of how many crew members uh, this space station will accommodate? Yes, this can hold up to three astronauts, or sometimes uh, folks refer to Chinese astronauts as taikonauts. I've seen both used, um, but yeah, three. Cool, sounds good. All right, uh, so we'll go back over to Stellarium. So I just want to show you. So these constellations that I'm putting up right now, these are the Western official constellations, the Greek and Roman ones. But I can actually change them to Chinese constellations and just look at the difference. There are so many. There's so many more. Um, and if I put the labels up, you can barely even read them. There's so many out there. And I wish that I knew everything about all of them because it sounds really cool. 
But the story that I wanted to tell is the story of the cow herd and the weaving girls. So again, the folks, at least from what I've read, a lot of folks in China are comparing the docking of all of these human capsules with the Tiangong space stations to the reunion between this forbidden love between the cow herd and the weaving girl. So if we zoom into this part of the sky, and actually we need to rotate. There we go. And we'll zoom in right over here. There are three pretty bright stars. So one is right here, the other's here, and the last one is down here. You may recognize them because they are part of the summer triangle. Um, in Western uh, astronomy, this is known as Vega, Deneb, and Altair. But in Chinese astronomy, this star is known as the weaving girl um, or Jinu. And this star, Altair, is the cowherd boy, um, or in Stellarium here, it's listed as the cowboy, um, Niu Long. So the story goes that these two were in love. That weaver girl, according to some versions of the story, was actually a fairy. And the boy was having some issues with his family and was kicked out of his house only with a cow to, to take him you know, on his journey to being independent. And the cow suggested looking for this fairy in the woods. And this fairy was the weaving girl. Um, and they fell in love. But the goddess of heaven, or Tianhe, um, the goddess of the Milky Way, the Milky River across the sky, um, forbid their love. I'm not sure why, but she didn't like it. She wasn't into it. So she banished the two on opposite sides of a silver river that she created in between them. And they are never allowed to meet, except for on one particular day, on the seventh day of the seventh lunar month um, in the Chinese lunar solar calendar, um, a, a big flock of magpies forms a bridge over the river so that they can meet for one full day, um, which is lovely, but also very sad. <laughs> And that is the story of the cowherd and the weaving girl. There's so many different types, um, not just in Chinese astronomy, but throughout Asia, there's a bunch of them. And there's a lot of festivals as well that are uh, created or celebrated um, yearly because of this particular story. It's very, very popular. The one festival that comes to mind is the uh, Jishi festival, which takes place every year on the seventh day of the seventh lunar month, which this year was back on August 14th, so not too long ago. All right, um, I will, let me just put up all the constellations one more time so you can see them because they look pretty cool all together. Hey, can you also just point out the um, Milky Way galaxy? between yeah. the two stars? Because I don't think you actually did that. Absolutely. So it's kind of easier to see it um, looking from far away. So this cloudy band here stretching across the sky, that is the plane of our Milky Way galaxy. And it looks like a band like that because we live inside of it. So we're seeing the densest part. Um, of our own galaxy. And it runs right through those two stars, Vega and Altair, or the Weaver Girl and the Cowboy. And in some stories, this star, the third star in the Summer Triangle, Deneb, is referred to as the magpie um, or the bridge that can connect the two. So here we are. And these constellations are, they actually are split up into four different directions. Um, so there you have like the black tortoise of the north, which is like a whole section of the sky, the blue dragon of the east, the red bird of the south, and the white tiger of the west. And then there's like 28 mansions split up in between. So it sounds very cool. And I need to learn a lot more about that. But that's all I got. Any other final remaining questions? No, thank you so much, Katie. Um, I'm just adding the Stellarium website to my closing slide so that I can show it to everyone because I did get a question about 
where people can actually uh, try that out for themselves. Awesome. Um, but do you want to say goodbye to everyone before yeah. we close out? Sure. Thank you all so much. Hope you enjoyed the show. Tune in next week. We will be talking about the International Space Station to wrap up our Space Station Month. Thank you, Katie. Um, and thank you all so much for tuning in this Tuesday and every Tuesday that you have actually joined us. Um, like Katie said, we'll be here again next Tuesday and we do this every Tuesday until October for sure. Um, and so let's see, I'm gonna share my screen. Oh gosh. Um, on the screen, you can see the Stellarium website. I believe it ends with .org. Katie, please just chime in if that's wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, yep. Looks okay. good. Perfect. So you can go to stellarium.org to actually try out that night sky application that Katie was using. You can also see our other virtual offerings at mos.org slash mos at home. And if you want to support the museum, you can visit engage.mos.org slash welcome. So with that, we will see you all next time. Thank you. Have a good one.